the Netherby left England for Queensland, full of immigrants hopeful for their future in Australia. Their passage to Australia would be a stormy start, however, and their prospects would be even worse when the ship wrecked on King Island. Over 400 people were now forced to make the best of being stranded with little food and no shelter. Hello, and welcome to the Shipwreck Archive. Thank you. Would you happen to have King Island claims the Netherby? Here we are. Enjoy! The people on the Netherby had experienced a miserable voyage. From the moment that they had left Plymouth in England, bound for Queensland, Australia, they had faced storms and adverse winds. Having departed Plymouth on the 13th of April, by the 15th, it was commented that many of the passengers wished themselves back in England already due to the strong storm they had encountered. Though the storms were unpleasant and caused a good deal of seasickness and anxiety with the passengers, the ship was well able to weather them. Once the storm had passed, the mood on the ship was lightened some, and people were able to look forward to their destination, as well as to think of ways to entertain themselves. The Netherby had a total of 451 people on board, only eight of them being the crew. The rest were people hoping to start a new life in Queensland. The variety of passengers shows the great variety of people who hoped to make Australia their new home. Though there were so many people pressed together on the 944-ton Black Ball Line ship, they were by no means a homogenous group. Just as on land, a strict class divide was enforced between saloon, second, and steerage class. Still, in many ways, their hopes for what Queensland could offer was something they all shared. Queensland had officially become a colony in 1859 and was far less densely populated than New South Wales, which it had separated from. To rectify this, many ships were recruited to bring people from Australia to settle. The Netherby was only one of many. With others writing back to England speaking well of their lives in Australia, it only made sense that more would follow. It was therefore many people traveling with their families, with everything that they could carry that boarded the Netherby in England, and this set some of the tone of ship life. It started to resemble almost a small town, with two of the first-class passengers entertaining themselves by starting a weekly newsletter to distribute among their fellow passengers. It is from this that we learn about things like the Sunday school that was started, the weekly devotional that was held on Sunday, and the weather that the ship encountered, both good and bad. It was this paper that announced to the passengers that one of the children in steerage, a four-year-old girl, had passed away shortly after they left England. Though it was not unusual for people to pass away during long voyages across the sea, to have a child pass away, especially so early in the voyage, seems to have touched the hearts of the passengers. More than one passenger wrote into the little shipboard newspaper, expressing their sorrow at the news. Documented in the pages of the newspaper were also the problems that would face any vessel so full of humanity all cramped together. The paper allowed for complaints from third, second, and first class to all be aired to the rest of the passengers, as well as the captain and ship surgeon to make general informative announcements. The first class passengers bemoaned that they did not see any third class passengers at devotions one Sunday. A second class passenger complained about the cramped nature of the second class area of the deck for exercise since it had to be shared with the school and third-class invalids who were brought up from steerage for air. A third-class passenger complained that people were playing cards and reading sporting papers on Sunday, 
and that that was what was causing the terrible storms the ship was beset with. It did indeed seem as though the ship was being tossed around on the waves more than any of the passengers would have liked. Something that was more a hardship because during rough weather, the passengers were confined entirely below decks for their safety and to keep them out of the way. In both of the issues from the last week of June and the first week of July, the paper carried letters from Captain Owens thanking the passengers for their bravery during the rough seas, as well as their patience with how they had been cramped below decks with little ventilation for so long. With this in mind, Captain Owens made a fateful decision in his route. While he had intended to travel south of Tasmania to Brisbane, he decided that the weather would be calmer and the voyage shorter if they took the Bass Strait which took the ship between Tasmania and Queensland. He felt as though the voyage had already been too hard on his passengers as it was. The path through the Bass Strait was a trickier one for ships, needing careful navigation between King Island and Cape Otway, but Captain Owens considered it worth the risk if it meant that there was a greater chance of his passengers having a smoother final leg to their journey. The Bass Strait was charted, and the dangers were known. That made them avoidable. With this frame of mind, he wrote into the ship's paper stating that he expected to see land within a week, and that they would meet with smoother seas and a nice climate when they reached it. This was not a promise he would be entirely able to keep. As they entered the Bass Strait, the weather was consistently overcast, and the seas were somewhat rough still. While it was not to the point where the passengers were forced to remain below again, it was bad enough that he was not able to take his navigational observation at noon for three days straight. They were now relying entirely on the compass, something that was perhaps less comforting for the passengers since Captain Owens had written an entire explanation of how natural deviations of the ship's compass could occur and the reasons behind it. At four in the afternoon, by the captain's reckoning, they were around latitude 40.5 south and 142.32 east. He instructed that the course be altered slightly before heading down to the tea table around sunset. On his last check of the ship's position, there was no land in sight, but that was comforting since he did not expect any. It therefore came as a surprise to Captain Owens when he heard the first mate, who was in charge of the watch, suddenly give the order to hard up on the deck around a quarter past seven. Though Captain Owens immediately got up to see what was wrong, the first mate met him halfway on his way to ask the captain to come up to the deck. What was discovered was that land was now just off the starboard bow. Though they tried to steer away, the weather was not in their favor and the ship grounded on a rocky shelf off King Island at around 7.30 at night with her bow firmly stuck. The ship had traveled only a little further south than intended, but with such a narrow passageway that could be used in the Bass Strait, such a deviation proved fatal to the ship. The first mate, Jones, went out in one of the lifeboats almost immediately after the grounding of the ship, intending to find land that they could ferry the passengers to. He was forced to give it up after three attempts due to the darkness of the night and the rough surf on the shore. Still not satisfied, Captain Owens went on personally, but did not have any better luck. Though First Officer Jones offered to attempt to swim with a rope to shore, he was quickly overruled as everyone on board could see that the chances were too high that he would be dashed to death on the rocks by the waves instead. With the ship starting to lean to one side while still being knocked by the waves, the crew decided to do what they could. 
Even if they had to wait until the next day to leave the ship, it was clear that they would quickly need to gather what supplies they could from her hold before she started taking on water. They grabbed ten bags of bread, the medical supplies, and some flour before the ship began to take on water quickly. The crew and the passengers did what they could with the ship's pumps to slow her intake of water, but it was of no use. She was too badly damaged. An hour and 45 minutes after having been grounded, she was full of water up to her between decks. It was left to the passengers to find shelter where they could, though the women and children were given the saloon and the fore cabin to use. Captain Owens would credit everyone for having behaved calmly, but it was admitted by many passengers to have been an anxious night with a constant fear that the ship would be broken up on the rocks by the waves before morning would come. The wind was rising, and the sails that were not fully furled were blown away. At about ten at night, there was another attempt to lower a ship's boat, this time the pinnace, but the rough waves dashed it to pieces against the ship, and it was considered a wonder that the two sailors who had been on the pinnace had escaped with their lives. That would be the last attempt of the night. With daylight, First Mate Jones once again took a lifeboat towards the shore, and though the jagged rocks and rough waves were still a threat, with the light of the day to guide them, they were able to attach a rope from the ship to a rock on the shore. This would be their lifeline. Using it as a guide for the lifeboats, the first and second mate began to ferry the passengers to the shore, with women and children first. With space for only around a dozen passengers on each trip, it was not until 3 p.m. that everyone was safely on shore, with no one having been injured or killed during the entire experience. The captain spoke well for the most part of how everyone behaved during the evacuation, though he admitted that he and the ship's surgeon had to remain on guard against too many people rushing the lifeboats, but he admitted this was natural anxiety. He did note that the first class passengers both men and women, refused to leave the ship until all of the other passengers were landed, something that he admired. The provisions that had been brought up from the hold fared less well on their voyage to the shore. Out of the sacks of bread, only one was landed, and that was damaged, while only three barrels of flour arrived on shore. The lifeboat that had already made so many trips back and forth full of people was now swamped and smashed against the rocks, while the provisions that had been on board it were thrown into the ocean by the waves. The crew that had manned the boat managed to escape with their lives, but the near miss had a demoralizing effect on the rest of the crew. The next time the boat that had been in the charge of the first mate left the Netherby, it was in the charge of the carpenter instead, as the first mate remained on the Netherby to assist in swinging out the captain's gig. The crew of the lifeboat left in the charge of the carpenter had had enough, however, and they left the carpenter hanging onto the line in the lifeboat while they dove into the sea and swam to shore saying they were done, risking their lives. Two of the crew that had already been on shore volunteered and swam out to the lifeboat to help the carpenter, but perhaps the rest of the crew had an inclination of what was going to happen, because this lifeboat was also smashed to pieces on the rocks as it arrived on shore. The gig was now the only boat left remaining, and Captain Owens, First Mate Jones, and the remaining crew finally left the Netherby around five in the evening after chopping down her masts in the hope that it would prevent her from breaking up any further. This boat arrived safely on shore, and was pulled up onto the beach in the hopes that they would be able to use it again at some point. They found that the passengers and crew that were already on the beach had already begun to look to the future, building shelters out of brush and starting fires to dry off. No food was handed out, 
but they did find a stream of fresh water, which was a relief to everyone since they had not been able to bring any water from the Netherby. The misery of the survivors' camp was only added to when it started to rain that night. The next day, it was decided to send second mate Perry out with some volunteers, all second class passengers, to walk across the island and find the King Island Lighthouse. The men were sent out with only a handful of bread each, since that was all that could be spared, and three letters. One letter was to the Colonial Secretary of Melbourne from the ship's surgeon, and the other two were from the captain one to the agents of the Black Ball Line in Melbourne, and the other to the man in charge of the lighthouse urgently requesting provisions. As it was, the only food handed out was a quarter pound of flour to each adult with women and children also getting a small portion of the bread. They were able to repair one of the lifeboats the next day, and used it to bring some more food as well as some of the passengers' luggage to the shore. Many of the passengers had been left completely destitute by the wreck, and anything that could be saved was desperately needed. The domestic nature of the ship, originally, was brought home once again as one of the passengers, a lady from steerage, also safely gave birth to a daughter only two days after being shipwrecked. What was on board the Netherby for most of the passengers was what they had thought they would need to set up a new home. For the next couple of days, the captain, crew, and some of the passengers did what they could using the gig and the lifeboat to bring as much to the shore as they could. The captain was starting to doubt if the second mate would succeed, however. With this in mind, the captain set out with four sailors in the lifeboat to see if he would have better luck reaching the lighthouse. Leaving the first mate in charge of continuing to bring things from the ship to the shore using the gig. The day after Captain Owens had left, a man arrived in a boat from the lighthouse with a letter from Captain Owens telling the rest of the survivors that he and the second mate had both arrived at the lighthouse safely with the second mate having arrived several hours before, a wonder considering how exhausted everyone had been by the wreck and the 35-mile trek. By the time the captain had arrived, the second mate had already borrowed a whaleboat from the lighthouse and had already set out to go tell Melbourne what had happened. Everyone in the camp was able to breathe a deep sigh of relief. And when Captain Owens returned to the camp himself that night, he was met with cheers. <laughs> Provisions in the camp were so scarce that the man from the lighthouse took 117 of the men who did not have families to the lighthouse with him. The remaining survivors were now forced to live on a half pound of flour per adult every day. Only a few hours later, the steamer HMVS Victoria appeared near the camp and Captain Owens went out to greet her. Soon to follow was the Pharos, which also anchored nearby. Second mate Perry turned out to have been the hero on this occasion. His voyage by whaleboat had been considered so dangerous that one of the men who had gone with him refused to join, and so Perry and two men, who had no experience with boats, set out to find help. The weather continued to be rough, and for all of that night and most of their next day, he and the other two were forced to fight their way in the direction of Melbourne. They finally reached Barwon Heads, where they found a surveying crew that helped them gain a horse. Still not able to rest, second mate Perry made the 26-mile ride to Geelong, where there was a telegraph he could use. The two ships not only brought supplies that were more than welcome in the starving camp, they also brought a means off of the shore for most of the passengers. 
Between the two ships, they were able to take all but 23 people off from King Island. And though there was no room for the remaining people, they were left with everything they would need to remain comfortable until another ship would come. Captain Owens was among those who remained, as were some of the first-class passengers. The day after the main group was taken off King Island, those who remained witnessed the somber moment that the Netherby finally broke apart and sank completely, spilling her contents out into the sea. Two days later, the HMVS Victoria and Pharos returned once again and collected those who remained on King Island to take them to Melbourne. Their arrival in Melbourne was met with a population eager to help. Most of them were taken to the exhibition building by cab drivers who refused any fare, where a hot meal and a place to rest awaited them. Not only that, but a general outpouring of charity from a populace sympathetic to those who had lost almost everything in addition to nearly starving. In total, the passengers had been castaways for eight days before help had arrived, and with such a large number of survivors, many of them families with children, the public did not want to see them suffer. The Queensland government also did what they could to fulfill their promise by hiring a steamer to take the passengers the remaining distance to Brisbane, as had originally been intended. Many of the passengers had lost the taste for it, however, and a good deal of them chose to remain in Victoria, starting a new settlement that bore the name of the ship that had brought them there, Netherby. For more information, please see the Netherby Gazette by Messrs. H. D. Vincent and Townsend, or see our other sources in the description below. Thank you for listening. Thank you for visiting the Shipwreck Archives. See you soon.